We take grits personally. I've eaten more bad grits in one lifetime. That's why I think I probably won't go to hell because I've already been in purgatory as far as like grits go. I'm Robin Sessingham and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and Southern charm. The Zest celebrates cuisine and community in the Sunshine State. One of my favorite writers is Rick Bragg. You might know him from his columns in Southern Living Magazine or from his best-selling memoirs, All Over But the Shouton and Ava's Man. He was a newspaper reporter for many years, and he won a Pulitzer Prize for his work at the New York Times. He now works as a writing professor at the University of Alabama's journalism program. Rick grew up in the Appalachian foothills of Alabama listening to his family's stories, and he sure did inherit the storytelling gene. His latest book is The Best Cook in the World, Tales from My Mama's Southern Kitchen. And this time he tells the story of his family through stories of food and the importance of a good meal in lives full of backbreaking labor and few pleasures. It's funny and sad and deeply human. I spoke to Rick Bragg recently, just before he came to Florida for his book tour. He was late for our interview because he had to have some medical tests, and they took longer than he thought they would. That's why, at the end of the interview, I ask him how he's doing. Why tell the story of your family through your mother's cooking? You know, you told your family story a lot of times, why this time through food? Well, when you tell a when you tell a true story about about family, especially you know the people from the foothills of the Appalachians, there's going to be a lot of grit in it, and there's going to be a lot of blood in it, and there's going to be knife fights and fist fights and killing and dying and hurting and loving and warring, and you know it's not going to be necessarily. It's not going to have room enough for what's really important, which we all know is food. Uh, I talk some about food, but uh, I think food is our finer nature. And the timing on this, I really didn't have much to say about it. My mom got sick, and uh, she had cancer, and she, we liked to lost her. And one day I just asked her, Hey, where's that recipe for, I think it was beef short ribs or something like that. And she said, well, hon, I've never written down a recipe. And it occurred to me that, you know, every bit of cooking she'd ever done in her life was with, you know, with ghosts. And every recipe had this great story behind it, uh, where it came from, how it was learned. Uh, And sometimes that was... You know, that itself was sometimes bloody or violent or hilarious. And you really got at her character and your grandmother's character and your great-grandfather's character through the way that they were in the kitchen. Well, that was kind of the joy in it, to get those stories. And I've been talking about my people for, you know, for a long time, for 25 years. It's, It's always amazed me that you could have a bestseller writing about poor mountain people in the deep south but this was a chance to to dig back a little bit further to the time of my grandfather you know uh, after reconstruction even before the great depression and where does this stuff come from And, and what about the character of the people who cooked it and you know a lot of the things my great great grandfather cooked uh jimmy jim bundrum were Let's face it, they were stolen. And if he hadn't been larcenous, they wouldn't have had that food to eat. He stole chickens and hogs and and uh, stole one cow that we know of, let it out onto a railroad trestle to perish, which is not kind, but it did result in some very good beef short ribs, I am told. so. During the Depression. Yeah. You know, they hadn't had beef in years. And... Um, I guess stealing a cow in order to provide that was more or less forgivable. But it gave me a chance to explore their character a bit, their hard-headedness and their 
their oddities maybe. Uh, apparently we got plenty of oddities in my family. And, and um, you know, the, the process of choosing a chicken to cook uh, was not done lightly. You know, you think you just go out and you snatch one up and send it to its maker and that's all there is to it. But but there, I had a wonderful time talking to my mother uh, about her mama telling her how you choose a chicken. You had to choose one, a poor character. You had to choose one that, you know, that wasn't worth anything except cooking. Yeah, because you wanted the other ones for breeding. Right, exactly. You wanted a good, strong line of chickens. And, you know, you wanted a good mama, you know, if you had a hen. And 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 describing the old man, my great-grandfather and my grandmother as a young woman sitting on a porch you know, gazing out at the yard and at those chickens and, and passing judgment on them. I wouldn't have had that if, if I hadn't asked my mama one day, what's a good chicken gravy? You know, what's a good roast chicken or what's a, what's a good chicken and dumpling? And it just you know, it became a food memoir, I guess. But the food was really more the timeline. And it was very easy to do because every good meal, there's going to be a story behind it. You know, pinto beans and ham, there's going to be a story behind it. What's the story of pinto beans and ham? Well, beans were the thing, the, the probably the first thing that my great-grandfather ever uh, really taught my grandmother to cook. And and the first thing he taught her was that country people and mountain people could not live without beans. And and pinto beans are the, the fancy bean, the banquet bean. And and pinto beans are not edible without pork. And the more pork you have, the better the bean. And the combination of ham and beans is for people who spend all day cutting timber or, you know, dragging some plow across the clay, that supper of of simple beans and cornbread was the best meal of the day. And it was the best moment of the day. It was the best time of the day. And first he had to impress upon her how important it was, you know, how important a simple thing like a bean was. Because in a in a life that was as hard as the one they were living, that was one of their great pleasures. If you could make something good to eat at the end of the day. Absolutely. I mean, imagine the first meal that he taught her to cook. It was pinto beans and ham, but not just little tiny little, just not just ham to flavor, but but skin and fat so that when you boiled the beans and ham together, you had this delicious kind of translucent nectar on the top of the beans where every bite tasted of that, that kind of lustrous, you know, uh, nectar. And then, you know, hot cornbread with one single boiled potato uh, and coleslaw, uh, maybe with a little carrot mixed in. And... You know, that's a feast. I, I, and the homemade butter for the cornbread. Exactly. You know, I'd go. It really makes you hungry. It doesn't. It? I mean, I'd, I'd eat that right now. Of course, my doctor says I can't, but I'd probably just defy him and do it anyway. You make the point right at the beginning of the book that this is not the low country cooking of Charleston or Savannah. You know, when you think about it, those places have all that seafood right outside their door. They have all that richness of low country cooking. And in the part of Alabama that you're talking about, they don't have that. So it's really a greater challenge to make good food in the part of the country where your people grew up than in those more maybe famous places. I, I think it required, a, a, in some ways, an even greater imagination. Um, for instance, um, a simple dish like beef short ribs, potatoes and onions. Well, that's not, you know, that doesn't sound uh, 
all that exciting unless you do it the way they did it, where the cooks took such care. It was just beef short ribs, you know, seared down a little bit, then covered in a minimum of water and cooked with, uh, cooked until tender and then covered in quartered hot Spanish onions and golden potatoes. And all of that then cooked down until the, the, the oil in the bottom of the pan mixed into those potatoes and the potatoes kind of began to puff up because you were cooking the liquid completely out of it and the onions would caramelize down in the bottom of the of the pan and all this just stovetop cooking you know just basically boiling beef but cooking it down to where there was not a drop of water left just that wonderful rich you know fat from the short ribs and well i'm glad you brought up that recipe because these are simple recipes there's just sometimes just a few ingredients but where you take care are in the instructions or how wh- how you call it, how to cook it. And you can hear your mother's or your grandmother's voice standing over you, telling you how to do it. You say, I- I- I'm reading from the book here, grits, as Jim declared, should have taste. This is how you know that you are not at the breakfast buffet at the Marriott or the Hilton or any other place that boils grits in unsalted water and serves them to human people that wretched way, unbuttered, unsalted, without care or conscience or consequence. <laughs> that, th- those, are, those are your cooking instructions. Well, it's, you know, we take grits personally. You know, it, it, it's, it's, um, grit should never be, should never be thin. You know, they should be thick and creamy and, you know, you don't have to get fancy with them. They just need to be salted. They need to be peppered and they need to be buttered. But, you know, in my mama's time, you could also throw in a few cubes of commodity cheese, you know, what we, government cheese, and have a, a, a real delicacy. And I go to places and I get like a $40 plate of shrimp and grits. And I think, this is just grits with commodity cheese in them. Only, uh, of course, it, you know, you can't get that good cheese anymore. But but grits should, I, I think, uh, one. I heard one great Southern writer say that, that grits should not be spooned out of the pan they should almost crawl out of the pan because they've got so many good things in them. And if you don't eat them right then, they should set up, not like concrete, but just set up firm so that you can you know, almost cut them with a knife. And, you know, that's where folks got the idea for casserole, you know, like grits casserole and cutting it into cubes or even frying it. But you don't have to be that fancy. You just need to season it. But I've eaten more bad grits in one lifetime. That's why I think I probably won't go to hell because I've already been in purgatory as far as, like, grits go. You know, I have had grits that were just an abomination. And uh, I'm still mad about it. You do take it personally. I do take it personally. Everyone should. You know, you should. We eat this stuff because we're conditioned to bad food. You said they took such care with the cooking. You know, it's not fast cooking; it's slow, and you had to pay attention. People worked hard to put that food on the table, and you don't want to waste anything. Imagine if, you know, the and I don't want to. Everyone understands the deprivations of the Great Depression. Although, you know, I'll I'll be 60 on my birthday, so it's it's really hard not to just start spouting. These young people, uh, but but everyone knows the suffering of the Great Depression. But in the foothills of the Appalachians, that depression began a little early and lasted a little longer. So a thing like a chicken, 
you know, you, 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 why in the world would you waste something so valuable? So you, you cooked it in an iron skillet. You, my, my mother's people cooked them in lard, but you cooked it in an iron skillet and you cooked everything in there with it. You cooked the gizzards and the liver, the necks, and you stood over it. it. It's almost like you're praying over it. In some ways, you probably are. But you stand over it to make sure that it is cooked just right. It's cooked through, but it's not dried out because that's wasting it too. And But that's real work to, to pan fry chicken. It's one of the reasons why we get most of our chicken in a cardboard box. But they didn't. You know, they could you imagine someone, you know, rendering lard to make cracklings and not paying attention? You'd burn the house down. You'd burn all the houses down. And it just required that kind of staring into the pot. Do you think there's one recipe in here that will catch on? Or is there, is there one that's your favorite? Chocolate pie, uh, fried pies. Anything sweet people tend to, to gravitate toward. But, but my favorite recipes in the book are things that I just don't get anymore. Um, for breakfast, biscuits and sliced fried potatoes with two fried eggs and sausage and bacon or sausage or bacon. Um you can't go buy that in a restaurant and have it taste. Or there's a recipe for diced tomato. We call it red eye gravy uh, over diced tomatoes in a biscuit. That's I only get that during tomato season in my mama's kitchen. Rick Bragg, thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, it's just this is truly my pleasure. Although I am a little bit hungry now. Are you doing okay? Yeah, I've had a little. You know, it's funny. Most of the things, most of my health trouble is related to all that great food that I ate as a kid. So, no, I, I'm going to be all right. I have, uh, my mother says that, uh, you know, I just, need, she told me, she said, you just need to eat some more salt. She said, you know, salt is good for you, she says. It says so in the Bible. Uh, and so she just thinks I don't get quite enough salt. Uh, I'm going to probably ignore that. That was Rick Bragg, author of The Best Cook in the World, Tales from My Mama's Southern Kitchen. We're coming into Florida's sweltering season, and if you can't stand the heat, you'd better be ready with some hot weather recipes. On a humid evening in April, the Zest attended the Longest Table, an outdoor foodie feast in downtown St. Petersburg with beautifully set tables and prefix food and wine pairings from some of Tampa Bay's favorite restaurants. The Longest Table is WUSF Public Media's signature fundraiser. And for producer Delia Cologne and me, it was a chance to ask local chefs what they like to serve when the weather heats up. I'm Tyson Grand, I'm the executive chef and partner at Park Shore Grill in downtown St. Petersburg. When it's hot, um, we don't like to eat the same way as when it's cool. So what's a good summer recipe? What do you serve when it gets hot out? Our favorite at the restaurant and probably one of our best sellers is called a lump crab meat salad. It's a cucumber, a little citrus vinaigrette, a little mango chutney, shaved avocado, a little frisé salad. It's been uh, also dubbed as probably a crack salad because people can't get enough of it. Ooh, crack salad. You don't think of salad as something people get addicted to. Right. And you would just mix everything up or kind of layer it? We layer it with a little bit of diced tomato and uh, the frisee on top, and then we garnish the plate with the avocado and the mango chutney. Sounds pretty. Um, how about one more? What's a good, what's a good summer dessert? Uh, fresh, fresh fruit, um, lightly dressed. Maybe with a uh, 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 vanilla mousse or something like that, something, uh, something refreshing. What's the deal with dressing a fruit salad? Because I feel like don't mess with Mother Nature, but what would you do to kind of enhance it? Dressing it, uh, if we do dress it, it's usually like with a raspberry vinegar um, and like some fresh herbs, some fresh mint, some fresh basil, something like that. Just it enlightens it. Nothing, I, I don't uh, really understand putting anything really sweet or cloying or, or creamy on fruit, but 
yeah, a nice vinaigrette, a little uh, raspberry vinegar on fruit is fantastic. Hello, I'm James Kirby, the uh, executive chef at Farm Table Kachina. Today we're doing a chilled pea soup. Uh, it's like 100 degrees out here and humidity is pretty typical of Louisiana, which is where I'm from. So the chilled pea soup is uh, you render pancetta, shallots, garlic until the, they become translucent. And then we just add in uh, veggie stock, potato, and uh, we cook that, puree that, and then we blanch uh, English peas separately, and then puree that and add that back into the soup mix. And then we take uh, mint and we smash it and just kind of throw it in just so it kind of perfumes it so it's not overwhelming or overpowering. It's just very subtle just to kind of accentuate the, the, the heat. Then what temperature do you serve that at? As cold as humanly possible. <laughs> um, I've been known in the past, I've run it through an ice cream machine just to get it cold enough. My name is Rachel Bennett and I'm the executive chef of the library in St. Pete. Um, so my go-to to serve when it's hot outside is going to be definitely a sorbet of some sort. Something that will cleanse the palate, refresh you, cool you down a little bit after your good meal. Okay. And what are you serving tonight? Are you having anything that's kind of like, you know, making a nod to this hot weather? Um, so tonight we have something fun in the back. We have some liquid nitrogen back there. So it's our hopes that the plate's going to come out smoking with some shattered coconut and a little bit of lemon ice cream that we made in-house. So what is it? Tell me, what's the dish then? So the dish is a coconut ricotta pound cake with a blueberry compote. There's some lemon curd on it, some shattered coconut, and then a lemon ice cream on top. And what's the, what's the role of the nitrogen? So the it? nitrogen will freeze the coconut, and then we can shatter it up. So we'll have coconut shards, and then it's going to be still smoking on the plate when it comes out. So it instantly freezes something. It's a big deal. Not something we'll make at home. Not something you can make at home. No, that's why, that's why we're here. Don't try this at home, people. I'm Ryan Clellan. I'm the president of Orange Blossom Catering. What do you serve when it's this hot? Well, one of the dishes we're highlighting tonight is a crab tort. It's got uh, crab with fresh, uh, jumbo lump crab with fresh cilantro. It's got avocado, uh, papaya, and it is a terrine with a vinaigrette dressing and uh, baby greens. And it's a very good summer dish. And that's a crab tort? Yes. I'm trying to picture what that would look like. Is it more it's like layered. a salad? Yeah, it's kind of like a Napoleon from a classical standpoint. It's layered with the papaya, the avocado, and the crab. I'm Andrew Thompson, executive chef at Sophie's Restaurant inside Saks Fifth Avenue, Sarasota. This time of year we like to serve lots of um, chilled summer soups. Um, tonight we're serving a chilled um, tomato and basil um, with olive oil gazpacho. Um, that's a nice refreshing chilled soup. Other, uh, other gazpachos made with um, peppers and cucumbers, anything chilled and refreshing. But I just felt like a, a wash over me of like coolness when you said the word gazpacho. How do you prep the tomatoes for a, a good gazpacho? We, uh, mar we marinate them for about 48 hours in lots of um, salt, lemon juice, little vinegar with some uh, cucumbers, peppers, bread, garlic, some jalapenos and lots of seasoning. My name is Gerard Jesse, I'm the executive chef at the Seafood Shack in Cortez. Um, simple dish that sells like crazy, actually two of them are fish tacos and a fish and chips. Simple, but everybody loves them, you know. And I, Do you have a secret for your fish tacos, a little different than anybody else is doing? Just simple, you know. A lot of times fresh seafood, um, a lot of people try to jazz them up too much and sometimes it's just simple flavors and good ingredients that make a good dish. What do you use for your sauce? For my sauce, we actually use a Baja sauce uh, and then we just top it with a pico de gallo. Um, and then we do a little slaw with it and then we blacken our fish to go with it and a little lime juice and that's it. My name is Zach Doth, I'm the event director of Sage. Give me, a, give me an example of a really good hot weather cocktail. I got two of them for you. It's called the Sage Club. It's got fresh blackberry and sage shrub, which is a vinegar based syrup that he makes in house. That's mixed with vodka, a little bit of uh, lemon juice and club soda. Awesome. And then he's got what's called the Conclusion, which has yellow chartreuse, tequila, um, lemon juice, and yellow chartreuse adds a really good botanical note to it. And then it's topped with a buzz button, served as a martini. It's nice and nice cold, and the buzz button, when you eat it, changes the entire flavor profile of your mouth. It feels like you've eaten Pop Rocks or a sparkler, and then it changes the flavor of the drink as it goes down. Look for that gazpacho recipe from Sophie's chef, Andrew Thompson, 
and the recipe for the crab tort from Chef Ryan Clellan of Orange Blossom Catering on our website, thezestpodcast.com. That's it for this week, but come back next time and visit us at thezestpodcast.com for recipes and stories that you might have missed. And be sure to subscribe to The Zest on our website or on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Robin Sussingham. Dalia Colon and I produce The Zest with help from Megan Tremble, Mark Hayes, and Craig George. The Zest is a production of WUSF Public Media.